Hello and welcome to our special coverage of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I am Ladi Akiri Duluale, the headlines. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky appeals for weapons ahead of G7 address, says he's in daily contact with his partners about weapons transfers. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan to attend a round of talks with the leaders of Sweden and Finland, as well as NATO, on Tuesday. And Russia is to transfer nuclear-capable Iskander-M missile systems to Belarus over the coming months. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has renewed calls for weapons ahead of his address to the G7 nations later on today. Mr. Zelensky is expected to urge the seven wealthiest nations in the world to send more heavy arms to his country and to impose tougher sanctions on Russia. The Ukrainian president has said Ukraine needed a modern air defense system to deter Russian missiles and was in daily contact with the country's partners about weapons transfers. In his 90 address, the president said that his partners needed to move faster if they are really partners, not observers, saying that within 24 hours, Russia had fired 72 missiles. He said leaders meeting at the G7 summit in Germany had the potential to stop Russian aggression. Частину ракет збито, але тільки частину. Нам потрібна потужна протиповітряна. Some of the missiles were shot down, but only part of them. We need a powerful air defense system, modern, fully effective. The one that can provide complete protection against these missiles. We talk about this with our partners on a daily basis. There are already some agreements. And partners need to move faster if they're really partners, not observers. Delays with the weapons transfers to our states, any restrictions. This is actually an invitation for Russia to hit again and again. The occupiers, these terrorists, must be beaten with all the strength so that they do not think they can oppress and outplace someone. What do these missiles show us today? What do yesterday's 62 missiles shot within just one Saturday, within 24 hours, show us? They show Russian handwriting to trigger escalation every time when international events take place. But it is possible only if we get everything we ask for, and in the needed time frame, both weapons and financial support and sanctions against Russia. It won't work otherwise in the war, because there, in the sky over Kyiv, in the sea near Odessa, on the land of Kharkiv region, Donbass, in Kherson city, and in Zaporizhia region, that is where it is decided. What life in Europe will be like in the future, it is here in Ukraine and nowhere else. And the conflict in Ukraine will continue to dominate the agenda on the second day of a three-day summit of G7 leaders in southern Germany, with uh, President Vladimir Zelensky set to join the talks via video link. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres is also set to join the group via video link to address the food crisis that has resulted from Russia's war in Ukraine, which is now in its fifth month. The conflict is preventing grain from leaving the country's ports and making food more expensive across the globe, with experts and aid groups warning of the potential for farming in parts of Africa and elsewhere. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan will attend a round of talks with the leaders of Sweden and Finland, as well as NATO tomorrow ahead of the summit in Madrid, Spain. That's according to his spokesman, Ibrahim Kalin. Speaking to broadcaster Habertürk, Mr. Kalin said he and Deputy Foreign Minister Sadat Ono will also attend a round of talks with the Swedish and Finnish delegation in Brussels today. Kalin said Mr. Erdogan attending the talks with Sweden, Finland and NATO on Tuesday does not mean we will take a step back from our original position, adding that Turkey and the Nordic countries had largely agreed on issues and would be in a better position in Madrid if they could agree on them during talks uh, today. And NATO leaders will urge Turkey to lift its veto over Finland and Sweden's bid to join the military alliance when they meet for a three-day summit tomorrow.
as the West strives to send Russia and China a signal of resolve. Negotiations among an often fractious organization are still underway, but leaders also hope to agree to provide more military aid to Ukraine, increase joint defense spending, cement a new resolve to tackle China's military rise, and put more troops on standby to defend the Baltics. And Russian President Vladimir Putin told a televised meeting with Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko that Russia will supply Belarus with Iskander M missile systems within a few months. At the meeting held in St. Petersburg, Mr. Lukashenko told Mr. Putin that Belarus was concerned by the, quote, aggressive, confrontational and repulsive policies of its neighbors, Lithuania and Poland. He asked Mr. Putin to help Belarus mount a symmetrical response to what he said were nuclear-armed flights by the U.S.-led NATO alliance near Belarus's borders. In particular, he asked for help to make Belarus's military aircraft nuclear-capable. Mr. Putin said he saw no need at present for a symmetrical response, but that Belarus's Russian-built Su-25 jets could, if necessary, be upgraded in Russian factories. He did, however, promise to supply the Iskander M, a mobile guided missile system codenamed SS-26 Stone by NATO, which replaced the Soviet Scud. Its two guided missiles have a range of up to 500 kilometers and can carry conventional or nuclear warheads. And allowing a Russian President Vladimir Putin to succeed in his invasion of Ukraine would have, quote, absolutely catastrophic consequences for the world British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has warned in a televised interview. Mr. Johnson had urged Americans, Britons and others in the West to maintain a resolve in punishing Moscow in spite of the effect of the war uh, and what it had done to global oil prices. He earlier promised further financial support for Ukraine, including another $525 million in guarantees for World Bank lending later this year, according to Downing Street. Leaders from seven of the world's most advanced economies are meeting, as we have been reporting, for their annual summit in southern Germany with Ukraine at the top of the agenda. While the leaders also will discuss and have been discussing food security, the European Union has been cautious about joining fellow G7 members to ban imports of Russian gold and said that it needs more certainty before signing up to a U.S. initiative to cap the price of Russian oil. A roundtable discussion between the leaders, which includes representatives of the European Union, marked the start of the summit, which is expected to end tomorrow. Leaders arrived early enough at Schloss El Mau in Bavaria, Germany, cheerful and demonstrating unity with the war in Ukraine top of the agenda, as well as the resulting global food insecurities. <laughs> Soon enough, they sit for a roundtable discussion to kick off the summit on Sunday. Well, good afternoon. During the summit, the U.S. President Joe Biden called for unity against Russia. He told the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz that his leadership had been crucial in marshalling Europe's response to Russian President Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Scholz had been under fire at home for allegedly dithering over what kind of weapons Europe's richest country should send to Kyiv in its first fight against Russian forces in the East. Scholz has always rejected these criticisms. He and President Biden later discussed global food security, with Scholz saying the summit's key aim is to send the message the Western sanctions on Russia. Meanwhile, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson and French President Emmanuel Macron agreed to provide more support for Ukraine in its war with Russia. Japan's Prime Minister Fumio Kishido met with the French President Emmanuel Macron, also on the sidelines of the summit. Leaders would later make statements, with President Biden saying the U.S. aims to raise $200 billion in private and public funds over five years to fund needed infrastructure in developing countries under a G7 initiative aimed at countering China's multi-trillion dollar Belt and Road project. 
The German Chancellor said all leaders of the group are concerned about a looming economic crisis as growth slows and inflation soars. He also said unity among leaders was causing the Russian President Vladimir Putin a big headache. And Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi said large investments in gas infrastructure in developing countries are needed. The first day of the summit ends with leaders winding down jackets off for photo ops before settling down again, probably for dinner. Let's talk now to the chairman of the Guild of Public Affairs Analysts, Enugu State Chapter, uh, Mr. Ambrose Ibuke, who joins us uh, from the Enugu State Capital. Uh, morning to you. Thank you for your time. Welcome. Good morning, Ladi. Let's, uh, let, let's unpack some of what we've been reporting. Uh, the G7 summit is rarely overshadowed by anything else, but on this particular occasion, uh, they're not really talking about the development of their individual economies. Uh, Ukraine is the big cloud, the big elephant, shall we say, in the room, uh, which everyone uh, seems to be talking about. First, uh, the issues on, on, on the ground in Ukraine and the issue of weapons transfers. The West, as represented by the G7, continue to make promises uh, and to transfer weapons and money uh, to Ukraine. But in Ukraine itself, the Russians are making advances, particularly in the East. Well, that's all. Please go on. Yeah, first of all, uh, we must admit that Russia is a big elephant. Russia is a very formidable nation when it comes to economy, when it comes to uh, sophistication of weaponry. But Russia is a permanent member of the Security Council of the United Nations. Not, Russia is not to be pushed over. Therefore, no country no coalition, be it NATO or be it G7 or whatever coalition you have, can frontally go against Russia, be it economically and be it in warfare. That has to be established. So I understand the dilemma of NATO and the dilemma of the G7. Uh, some people have argued that they have been mounting this for a while. Why have they not supplied the enough uh, system to Ukraine? But we try to understand that Russia has warned and drew a red line that if NATO tries to provide attacking systems to uh, Ukraine, they will escalate the war, I think it will not higher. And NATO doesn't want to do that. Let's also look at the strategic economic importance of Russia in Europe. Most of the gas needs, energy needs of uh, a lot of European countries are supplied by Gazprom. Gazprom is the Russian national oil company. And most of Europe is still dependent on that gas. In fact, recently, uh, last week, uh, the German, uh, Germany had to you know, fire up its coal uh, energy uh, center, because, which has been abandoned for so many years now, because they are having a short supply of gas from Russia. So it is not easy. It can be mounted. It can be set in diplomatic circles. It can be press statements can be issued, but Europe cannot do without Russia. And so that is why when America sometimes they have some kind of detachment from Russia, because they are not dependent on Russia for a lot of economic needs, when they want to go at Russia, we always soften and say, hey, wait, wait, wait there. We have dependence on Russia. Look at the, uh, look at the grains also, the issue of grain exports from Ukraine that have been, uh, the port has been blockaded. It's affecting Europe seriously. So um, even the G7 themselves, the members of G7, uh, two of them are fighting heavy political battles in their, in their home countries. Uh, Emmanuel Macron, who though won his uh, second his, uh, term, but uh, his party lost in the, uh, in the legislative arm. And basically he's battling that and trying to figure out how the four and a half years of his presidency will look like. Uh, the same thing with uh, Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson is having it tough in the in, in U UK as well. So these are, they're having their own battles to deal with at home. So, and then uh, Germany is not too keen on, uh, you know, trying to put too much sanction on Russia because they are dependent on them. Uh, you can see the divergent views of the G7 members when it comes to imposing uh, the uh, embargo on gold, uh, Russian gold. 
uh, a lot of them that said they are not ready yet. So this is where they found themselves. It is not an easy situation when you are dealing with a country like Russia that is very formidable indeed. Let's, uh, let, let's, let's look at uh, the one that concerns uh, the broader picture, uh, and that's the fact that in spite of all of this, uh, Russia is continuing its advance on the ground. Uh, over the weekend, uh, the Ukrainian forces had to withdraw um, from uh, Severodonetsk. And uh, just this morning, uh, it's been reported that uh, Russia has, in fact, captured several more villages, uh, several more settlements on its way to the other big city, uh, which it, uh, it is yet to capture, which is Lishishank, uh, uh, which is just across uh, uh, from uh, um, Severodonetsk. Essentially, what the reports seem to indicate is that the capture of Lishishank is inevitable. It may take some time, but it's going to happen. And subsequently, Russia will be in control of most, if not all, of eastern Ukraine, which it said was what it wanted in the first place. So at the end of the day, do you see that all of this, all the moves by NATO, the moves by the G7, the moves by the EU, uh, essentially will come to nothing if Russia eventually uh, gets its way in eastern Ukraine? Just as you said, Ladi, uh, the, we are just uh, postponing, uh, in quotes, the evil day. Because Russia has made it very clear at the onset of the invasion that it was going to capture the eastern part of Ukraine, which is a Russian-speaking side, claiming that that side of Ukraine is the, is, belongs to mother Russia and that they have to, uh, they have to annex it, just the way they annex Crimea which it was the northern-speaking part of uh, Georgia. So they are also ready to do this. They did it in 2012, and nothing happened. So they are going to do it again, knowing their place. You see, when you understand your position in the scheme of things, then you can behave the way Russia does. Russia understands its position. Russia understands its power. Russia understands its might. And Russia understands that nobody can threaten it because it is a code. Among them, in the permanent member of the Security Council, Russia is a nuclear, nuclear nation, bearing nation. Russia has the biggest armament, nuclear armament in the world. So which country or coalition of country wants to try that kind of nation? So they are deliberate about it, and they will capture the rest of the eastern Ukraine and annex it. Because if, if they did it in, George, uh, in Georgia, when, when they did in Crimea, and no, nothing happened, then, you know, uh, nothing will happen this time around. So it will come to naught, and it's, uh, it's very painful that it's the Ukrainian people that will suffer for this because they are innocent citizens. They are not in a political chess game. And, uh, this is about muscle flexing between NATO and Russia. It has nothing to do with the welfare of, uh, of uh, citizens of Ukraine. It has nothing to do with the advancement of Ukraine. Uh, so it, it, it's all about... Um, muscle flexing when it comes to sphere of influence for both uh, uh, NATO or United States and uh, uh, Russia. Uh, before I let you go, I must ask you about this. Uh, we, you did mention uh, or talk about escalation uh, in your answer to the earlier question. And I wonder what you make of the fact that Russia is promising its ally Belarus that it is going to um, hand over, shall we say, or arm it. Uh, with nuclear-capable missiles to defend itself against uh, Lithuania and Poland, which Belarus is claiming uh, have uh, uh, made aggressive yes. postures towards it. Okay, uh, okay, I understand. Well, why, why, why are we having this? Please go on. Please go on. I, 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 we lost you for a second there. Please start again. Uh, just give us the answer to the question. The Iskandar missile is okay. being uh, handed over to Belarus. Well, I didn't get your question about that. My question was that Russia is handing over, it says it will hand over in the coming months, uh, Iskandar uh, nuclear-capable missiles to Belarus uh, to help it uh, fight off what Belarus is claiming to be aggressive uh, motions made by Lithuania and Poland, who are both members of the EU. Is this not an escalation or a widening of the conflict that has so far been uh, limited to Ukraine? 
well, it's an escalation already, but I'm sure that Russia will not uh, hand over attacking systems because there's a code, there's, there's what we call uh, MAD in international diplomacy, MAD, which means mutually assured destruction. Mutually assured destruction is a concept which says that we mutually have what it takes to destroy each other. Therefore, we make sure that we don't activate that, that uh, asana that can make us destroy each other. So if you watch what NATO has been giving to Ukraine, it have been defense, defense systems also. Russia will also give the defense system to uh, Belarus, as Belarus is claiming. Now, the war is widening. It is no longer NATO, Ukraine, Russia. Now, Belarus is getting involved. Before you know it now, other nations will get involved. That is how World War uh, starts. That is how the First World War started. That is how the uh, Second World, World War started. And people who are starting this war are always Europe. First World War, Europe. Second World War, Europe. Then they will drag the rest of the world into it and called it World War. So I think at this stage, we don't need any world wars, in quote, because those wars are not actually world war. But sometimes it affects, because of how the world is being structured, being a global village, it tends to affect the rest of the world. So Europe should spare us these uh, uh, kind of uh, human carnage and uh, you know disquiet that we are enjoying in the globe and try to come together to work out a solution. Uh, if Russia, if Russia wanted, uh, uh, you know, if uh, they speak, if Russia became part of Ukraine, wanted to be part of Russia, that's what you call the plebiscite. That's what you call referendum. I don't know why that route was not taken. And then all we have is war, you know, invasion, testing of weapons and all those kind of stuff that's going on. Uh, so it is not good news that uh, the, uh, Belarus is even joining in the fray. It's not also good news that uh, Russia is making advancement. It's not also good news that the West is still talking tough. That's why that uh, the people that are pushing the Ukraine are still uh, at the short end of the uh, short end of the stick. So um, something needs to be done urgently, and that thing is round table, it's negotiation and not weapons. Indeed, thank you very much, uh, uh, Ambrose Ibuke, Chairman, Guild of Public Affairs Analysts, Enugu State Chapter, for your time this morning. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Ladi, for having me. After the break, U.S. to announce purchase of advanced missile defense systems for Ukraine. Please join us again. Welcome back. Pat, thanks for staying tuned. U.S. President Joe Biden has thanked German Chancellor Olaf Scholz for his leadership throughout the Ukrainian crisis, uh, speaking during the G7 summit, saying you've done an incredible uh, job. Uh, quotes Putin is counting on from the beginning that somehow NATO would and the G7 would also splinter. But we haven't and we're not going to. The leaders of the G7 countries seek to show long-term support for Ukraine, even as the war's growing impact on the world economy tests their resolve. And we got to make sure we have this, uh, us all staying together, you know, we're going to continue working on the economic challenges we face. But I think we can get through all this. Yeah. We can come out stronger. And the good message is that we all made it to stay united, which obviously Putin never expected. And that was in no small part because we no small part because of you, seriously. Because there was a lot of discussion of whether or not in the transition or well, how it's going to work. But you've done an incredible job. I want to thank you for it. Thank you, thank you. We have to stay together. Because yeah. Putin has been counting on from the beginning. And somehow NATO would, uh, and the G7 would splinter. And, but we have it, and we're not going to. So can't let this aggression the European Council President Charles Michel has said that caps on Russian oil prices must hit Russia and not the G7 and its partners. During a speech uh, during the G7 summit, Mr. Michel said the G7 would discuss details about such an agreement in the upcoming hours. He also talked about the global food insecurity caused in part by Russia's blockade of Ukrainian grain. Mr. Michel said actions, not speeches, were needed. Uh, he takes part 
uh, in the G7 summit in his role as representative of the European Union, uh, representative of the EU has taken part in the G7 meetings since 1981. G7 countries, we all share the same goals, to cut the oxygen from Russia's war machine while taking care of our economies and the economies of our partners. The EU will stand by the people of Ukraine for the long haul to defend its sovereignty and territorial integrity and to strongly defend our common democratic values. We'll also discuss food security, a growing global concern. The Kremlin is using food as a silent weapon of war and we must vigorously counter Russia's propaganda about food and fertilizer prices. Russia's dangerous hunger games is solely responsible for the global food crisis. The first element uh, I can confirm that uh, we will discuss in the following hours this uh, proposal uh, to put in place uh, uh, a technical mechanism uh, uh, which would, uh, would have a, the effect of a, of a cap, especially on the services that are related to oil, uh, transport, insurances, etc. But uh, we want to go more into the details. We, we want to fine tune. We want to make sure that uh, if we were to go in the direction uh, we will uh, have uh, the need for the support of the 27 European Union member states and want to make sure that, uh, uh, like I said just before, uh, the goal is well to target uh, Russia and not to make our life more difficult and more complex. There are many challenges uh, that we need to overcome and we need to make sure if we take such a decision that we have a clear vision, a clear common understanding about what are the direct effects but what could be uh, the collateral consequences. The United States plans to announce as soon as this week that it has purchased an advanced medium to long range surface to air missile defense system for Ukraine. And that's according to a source familiar with the announcement. The United States President Joe Biden, who is in Germany for the G7 summit, uh, primarily focused on Ukraine, announced this earlier this month that the U.S. would provide Kiev with more advanced rocket systems and munitions as its war with Russia grinds on. Washington is also expected to announce other security assistance for Ukraine, including additional artillery, ammunition, and counter-battery raiders to address needs expressed by the Ukrainian uh, military. Tragedy. More than 100 bodies have been found under the debris of a residential building in Mariupol, and that's according to its mayor's advisor. Petro Andrushenko says in a post on Telegram that there were no plans by Russian forces to retrieve and bury the bodies after the housing block was hit by an airstrike. The port city fell to the Russians last month, having been all but destroyed by weeks of shelling. And Russian President Vladimir Putin will visit two small former Soviet states in Central Asia this week in what would be the Russian leader's first known trip abroad since ordering the invasion of Ukraine. Pavel Zarubin, the Kremlin correspondent of the Rosia State Television Network, said Mr. Putin would visit Tajikistan and Turkmenistan and then meet Indonesian President Joko Widodo for talks in Moscow. Mr. Putin's last known trip outside Russia was a visit to Beijing in early February, where he and Chinese President Xi Jinping unveiled a no-limits friendship treaty hours before both attended the opening ceremony of the Winter Olympic Games. And another official collaborating with the Russian occupation of Kherson has been the target of an assassination attempt. The Russian state news agency TASS said that a car belonging to Irina Makneva had been blown up in the town of Kakovka. TASS said Makneva is in charge of education and culture issues in the new administration, and it said she was not hurt. According to the agency, the explosive device went off earlier than planned, which saved her life quoting the regional police department in Kherson. Let's talk to the director of the Geneva Center for African Security and Strategic Studies, David Otto, joins us from London. Morning to you, David. Thank you for your time. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Good morning. The, the Russian president is going uh, outside of Russia for the first time in about four, four and a half months. Is this a... Is this a sign that he's becoming more and more confident that uh, 
he's got things under control, both within Russia and in uh, the situation with Ukraine. Over the weekend, his forces seized several Donetsk, and this morning we're hearing reports that several other towns on the way to Lishishank have also uh, fallen to the Russians. So possibly it's just a question of time before they control virtually the Donbas region. Effectively so. Um, like you said, uh, since the invasion of, uh, of Ukraine, uh, the, the president has not been has not stepped out of uh, the country. And, uh, you know, this is very indicative of the fact that uh, there is some level of uh, strategic comfort um, in, in that, you know, there is some battlefield progress being made. Um, now, I don't know if that is going to, um, uh, you know, lead to a complete victory at, at the end. Uh, but I think, you know, the Russian president is, is much more comfortable uh, with with the position uh, which in which um, they are, you know, from a an operational perspective. I, I mean, as you rightly mentioned, uh, the entire Serrano Jones, you know, is now falling uh, to to the Russians, and of course, effectively, that means that Luhansk um, is now under the full control of uh, Russian troops. Um, so that is a milestone, you know, uh, in the eastern. Um, you know, a chase over the, the, the entire region. So perhaps, you know, we would see uh, some kind of a, uh, a focus now on, on Donetsk itself, you know, uh, so that, you know, uh, the Russians can then uh, perhaps, you know, finally claim the entire Donbass um, industrial heartland. Um, of course, I, I know that, you know, there will still be a lot of resistance. You've seen the European Union, um, the, the G7, uh, talking about, uh, uh, you know, giving more assistance to, to the Ukrainians. But, you know, um, in, in, in the grand scale of things, I don't think um, more heavy weapons, you know, will make any difference. Because, again, effectively, uh, this is still um, significantly a battle that is being fought entirely within the Ukrainian territory. Um, so the destruction still comes down to the Ukrainian territory. So, you know, Russia is, you know, is, is, is somehow still in front. Um, you know, uh, despite um, all the analysts um, saying otherwise. Um, it's a comfort, you know, for Putin, I would say. Do you think, uh, my last guest just before you came on, uh, talked about the fact that uh, Ukraine is kind of uh, hamstrung in this because all the help it is getting is defensive. Uh, most of the weapons, virtually all the weapons that it has received, all the help militarily that it has received, is to defend itself. It cannot go on the offensive, and that's because at the start of the war, uh, the Russians may declare that anyone who supplies Ukraine with offensive weapons will also be a target of, uh, of a Russian attack. So the EU, the G7, uh, NATO are not quite willing to uh, step into the crosshairs. And therefore, at the end of the day, when all is uh, put down, beyond all the propaganda on both sides and so on. The hard fact is that Ukraine is fighting um, with, its, with one hand tied behind its back. I think they're actually fighting with two hands, you know, tied behind their backs, you know, because of course, um, uh, again, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, effectively Ukraine is fighting in Ukraine. Um, so no matter how defensive or offensive you are, uh, you're still in a, in a much more defensive position because uh, you're not, um, you know, taking the war or, the, you know, the battle to the enemy. You're still taking the battle within your own territory. Um, so, um, you know, in, in other words, uh, even if Ukraine were to be given offensive weapons, uh, which, you know, I believe that they are being given offensive weapons, but not officially, um, you know, uh, it, it, will make, it won't make that much of a difference. I mean, Russia is a superpower. I mean, they've got, um, you know, enormous firepower, even if, uh, the entire European Union were to pour its um, uh, its military, uh, you know, within Ukraine. As long as it still goes to, uh, you know, um, the Ukrainians themselves using these weapons, um, rather than having troops on ground from other European states helping Ukraine, officially, of course, um, then I still don't see uh, that much of a difference. You know, I, I think what we would say is Russia being slowed down um, on the insurgency side of the battle, which is the horizontal war where, uh, you know, uh, the Ukrainians will set up ambushes and all that. But uh, with the overwhelming force and the fact that Russia is not fighting in its own territory, it makes the battle and the war very easy for them. Um, so, um, to be honest, I think, um, 
you know, Ukraine, you know, will struggle, irrespective of how much um, assistance is being given, irrespective of the sanctions that um, have been uh, le le leveled against Russia. We are not seeing any difference. All we're saying as, as of now is that Russia is seizing more territories. Uh, there is also the fact that it, it does appear as if the situation is kind of expanding. Uh, right from the start of this war, we knew that Belarus uh, was an ally of uh, uh, Russia. Its, its territory has been used uh, to stage incursions into Ukraine. It has provided uh, quite a bit of help uh, to Russia. But now uh, we're hearing that the Russians... Uh, the Russian president has promised the Belarusian president that uh, they're going to hand over Iskander missiles, uh, which are nuclear capable uh, uh, to Belarus, to fight off Lithuania and Poland, which uh, Belarus says uh, are making aggressive uh, intentions known towards it. Uh, it. This looks like the theater of conflict might be expanding beyond Ukraine. My enemy's enemy is my friend. I, I mean... Uh... Uh, what the Russians are looking at doing here is to ensure that um, um, you know they you know they, they safeguard the interests of the allies you know against the enemies of the allies. Um, if Belarus you know were to um, continue to give its assistance to to Russia, then of course um, Russia must also ensure that it has the capabilities um, that it requires you know to fend against um, any neighboring states. And effectively, that's what um, you know Putin is doing. I mean, um, uh, th there is nothing worse than a, a Russia that has no uh, no friends. Uh, and you know, of course, we've seen that uh, Belarus has been very overt uh, in the way that you know it, it has been assisting uh, you know Russia during this um, very um, invasion with uh, Ukraine. So um, you know, th that is what any country would do. That's what Russia would do, because of course it does want again, as I mentioned earlier on. Uh, to, to make sure that um, it's if that's the uh, support uh, that it has. You know, very few countries are willing uh, due to the, uh, the very impact of, um, you know, what the European Union, the US, the UK would say to assist Russia overtly. Um, so um, it's, it's down to Russia, and I think, you know, Russia is just doing the strategic thing. Uh, to and now, you, that, you know... You are an expert yeah. in all of you are an expert in all of this, so I, ha I have to ask you this uh, before I let you go. Uh, President Putin is going to Tajikistan and Turkmenistan. Uh, there are many people who can possibly not find those two countries on a map, uh, uh, and probably in many instances may not have even heard of those two countries. And then subsequently, he's going to meet the Indonesian leader in Moscow. Do you think there's a strategy, particularly to the two places he's going? Uh, to visit. Is there a strategy uh, that you could possibly think of in his mind? I think the immediate strategy is um, uh, Putin is looking for friends. Uh, he's, he's looking for more allies, um, you know, um, and, and that's the only strategic reason why uh, at this time when Russia is uh, under, um, you know, uh, the, you know uh, sanctions and everything from the European Union and the U.S., um, you know, Russia will be looking towards, you know, getting more allies uh, from the countries that you've named. Uh, perhaps, you know, because these countries, of, of course, uh, uh, they, they've been a, a victim of uh, uh, the neighboring Afghanistan crisis. You know, they haven't been, uh, you know, in very excellent uh, relations with the West. And, and so what you look for is you, um, you pick out those nations um, that uh, don't have the best, you know, uh, some kind of diplomatic relations with the West, um, and then you then bring them on your side. So for Putin, I think the first step for him is to expand uh, his friends, you know, and to perhaps, you know, you know persuade those other countries that are in the middle uh, to join and support, you know, its, um, uh, its invasion in Ukraine. Even if it means, you know, them remaining neutral, that's a win-win for, for Putin. So um, at this point in time, what Putin is looking for is very simple. He's looking for friends. Indeed. Uh, thank you very much, uh, David, uh, for your perspective, as usual, of course. Uh, we'll be coming back to you Tom, from time to time uh, for uh, your perspective on all these uh, developments. But for now, thank you and have a pleasant day ahead of you. Thank you.
Energy ministers from the European Union will meet this week to attempt joint plans to fight climate change. The previously scheduled meeting will also give the officials a chance to discuss emergency plans to reduce gas demand, which the EU is expected to draw up in coming weeks in case of further cuts in supply from Russia. The energy ministers meeting today and environment ministers meeting the following day are also expected to agree on common positions on proposed laws to meet a 2030 target to cut net emissions by 55 percent from 1990 levels. Brussels says the energy supply crisis this year caused by Russia's invasion of Ukraine means the 27 EU countries should move even faster to wean themselves off fossil fuels. But the threat of an economic slump from surging energy prices has also made some countries more cautious about swift change that they fear might bring more disruption. Some Taiwanese holders of Russian eurobonds have not received interest due on May 27 after a grace period expired yesterday evening. President Vladimir Putin signed a decree on Wednesday to launch temporary procedures and give the government 10 days to choose uh, banks to handle payments under a new scheme, suggesting Russia will consider its debt obligations fulfilled when it pays bondholders in rubles. One of the Taiwanese sources told news agencies that with the two eurobonds in question, there was no ruble clause attached. And as we've just reported, Russia has in fact missed the deadline on payment of its foreign currency sovereign debt for the first time in a century, as the 30-day grace period on about $100 million of two bond payments due on May 27 have expired. Russia has struggled to keep up payments on $40 billion of outstanding bonds since its invasion of Ukraine on February the 24th, which provoked sweeping sanctions that have effectively cut the country out of the global financial system and rendered its assets untouchable to many investors. The Kremlin has repeatedly said there are no grounds for Russia to default, but is unable to send money to bondholders because of sanctions, accusing the West of trying to drive it into an artificial default. And after the break, Eurovision winner says stars showing support for Ukraine has really helped it. Please stay on with us. Let's unpack some of the business developments as we welcome you back to the Russian invasion. Ini John McQuarrie of our business desk uh, joins me for this one. And uh, Ini, morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let's uh, talk about Russia's default. Mm. Is it really a default? <laughs> they, said they call it a technical default because obviously Russia will not agree that they've defaulted because uh, they do have the money uh, that's in gold and in foreign currency. They do have it. And uh, it's just American banks can no longer process, you know, after that uh, arrangement which the uh, U.S. made expired and they, re and they refused to renew it. So they have said uh, they don't see this as a default. But uh, investors will actually feel it as a default because they have not received the money. Now, what, is, what the investors are supposed to do in a normal situation is to go to courts and negotiate, maybe renegotiate the bonds and see how they can be compensated and maybe have some form of payment arrangement. But unfortunately, even that is not possible at this time. As you know, Russia has been cut off from, you know, every, everywhere, every conversation, everything. everything. So uh, I guess investors will just have to wait and see but it, it's also interesting to know that even before now some people actually have very high risk and bought off some of these bonds albeit lower so for instance if I had the bonds and I saw this coming I saw the default coming so um, and if you are interested and you have a higher risk than I do then you would buy it at a you know, at a cheaper, at a, yeah, so, a steep e discount. Exactly, but I'll know that at least I'm not losing totally. But you are hopeful that one day or very soon there'll be negotiations, or the war will be over, and then you'll be able to make the most of the investment that you have. So I mean, there are different kinds of investors <laughs> in the scene. Indeed. Uh, uh, last week, or was that two weeks ago? We talked about uh, the airline mm -hmm. in Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, um, 
ordering 300 new yes. aircraft. And I remember that on that occasion, you, you, you spoke to that and said, yes, they may all make that order, but it's, uh, it's touch and go to see how much <laughs> impact that would have. Exactly. Now the posting record losses. 61.1 billion rubles uh, is their loss for the first quarter of this year. That's just for the first quarter of this year. And, I mean, it doesn't come as a surprise. The only thing that comes as a surprise is the fact that Russia is still promising that they are going to uh, manufacture parts, that they are going to have their aircraft and run the aviation sector on their own. Now, before the war, they had about, uh, I think, about 900, 980 aircraft. 777 of those came from the Western world. That means that the maintenance, the parts, and everything comes from the Western world. Now, they have boldly and confidently said they're going to maintain and keep taking care of that. Obviously, that is one reason why we see this much losses, uh, because Britain, Canada, everybody have cut their uh, travels, right. you know, with all of them and their transactions and all that. But, I mean, what we'll be looking forward to is to see how really Russia is going to be able to maintain, you know, go past this, because, I mean, to even maintain, I know that the ruble is doing well, the ruble is at a, actually at a seven-year high. <laughs> the ruble is at a seven-year high as we speak. I don't know what kind of magic that is going on there, but the ruble is at a seven-year high, but the aviation sector is getting steep blow. 61.1 billion rubles lost for the first quarter of this year alone. I don't know how they will get out of that. I don't know how they're going to do the parts they say they're going to do. I don't know how they're going to get the personnel you know, because buying or, cre or manufacturing the parts is one thing, yeah. but the skills, you know, that will take care of it and fix those things is also another thing. I don't know how, how they will do that. We'll, we'll, we'll be looking at them <laughs> and to see and, and see how it comes out. And we'll out. be here discussing as long as the war goes as, on. As, as long as the war is going exactly. on. Exactly. Egypt is to use the ruble to trade with Russia. Again, another non-surprise. Mm -hmm. Although this would probably surprise some of Egypt's supporters in the West mm -hmm. who thought that it would heal to their side. But mm -hmm. then Egypt is also a big purchaser of Russian weapons. Big one, very big one. They depend on them. They depend on their wheat. I know Egypt doesn't joke with bread. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. that has led to several... Uh, Protests and yes, all that, you yes, know. Indeed. So I think, well, uh, as I said earlier, it's not really... Uh, 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 they are not in the fix because they also have this deal they're supposed to be supplying gas to European countries who are weaning themselves from Russian gas. So to now have them, you know, work so closely in um, um, uh, increasing their exports and imports, their trade with Russia is on the one thing. And Russia is building the first nuclear plant in Egypt. I heard you talk about nuclear plants, you Indeed. know, with some yes. of your guests earlier. Yes, yes. Russia is doing that in Egypt. They are building a nuclear plant in Egypt. 85% of it is being sponsored by Russia. So I don't know what Russia stands to gain, but I guess Egypt should also watch their back because, I mean, they have... This is real politics at play <laughs> because uh, <laughs> if you're able to draw two people who are opponents uh, to provide you with things, uh, uh, that, 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 that is... But you playing. must be paying for it one way or the other. Yeah, maybe we're not just aware of how, Exactly. Right? Yeah, we'll That's why I said out. Egypt should also watch their backs because one time Ukraine and Russia were really close and they had that nuclear plant and that nuclear plant has become a weapon at this time uh, in the midst indeed. of the war. So Absolutely. I think Egypt should, should also... Well, over the weekend, there were arguments. First, it was a speculation and then later on, there was a semi-formal announcement. <laughs> semi-formal. Yes, because... Uh, it, the, the, but now, I, I think... It's all but a done deal, although there are a few holdouts behind the scenes. Uh, the ban on Russian gold, yeah. uh, movement of Russian gold uh, within uh, Britain, the United States, Japan, Canada. and Canada, yeah. which means that there are some countries, uh, <laughs> otherwise we would be talking about the EU or yes, NATO and so on. Exactly. But the specific countries, countries are mentioned. the ones mentioned, yes. which means the others may not have signed I up completely yet. I, yeah. I'm, well, and it's important to know that uh, Russian gold exports was, was worth 15.5 
billion dollars last year. So it's also uh, a major source of revenue for, for, Russia. for Russia. But as you noted, it's not all the EU countries. And um, one other conversation that goes on around that is we do hope that the sanction and non-sanction sanction and survival of economies will not split the EU at this time. Because Indeed. we've seen countries like you, um, Hungary, you know, really standing their grounds to say we cannot survive. We've seen Germany that is going all whole. We've seen them talking about recession. Indeed. You know, even the UK that is supposed to be self-sufficient talking about recession. They've had two negative GDP growth. And inflation now. Is, is, inflation is at the roof. Exactly. Is 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 at the roof everywhere. So it's it's a major test. Uh, and it seems like it's a major test more for the country, the the unfriendly, the Russian unfriendly countries. The now. countries that impose the sanctions. Yes, it's it's it's. I mean, it, it looks like a, a contradictory situation because the country that is supposed to be feeling the impact, which is Russia, we see them apart from. I mean, their equities are back now. Um, and then we see that uh, even the oil and gas is still, China is still there, India is there, Sri Lanka is looking for how to even get into uh, Russia's uh, oil buying uh, list, you know. So uh, I don't know, I don't know. But I mean, something has to be done if a country is actually seen doing what Russia is doing to Ukraine. I mean, I know there are surrounding stories and politicking all around, but I guess it, it will not uh, be fair for the world to just fold their arms and, and do watch, nothing, indeed. you know. But the rippling effect is everywhere, even here in Nigeria, as we know. Uh, <laughs> that, would, that, that would be the subject possibly of tomorrow's <laughs> okay, discussion because right, I, have a couple, I have a couple of questions for you on that. Okay. But for now, Ine, thank you. Thank, thank, thank you for you, having thank me. You, thank you. <laughs> Let's take a look at some of the sports stories coming out of uh, the Russian invasion. Polish tennis star Hubert Hilcox is hoping his powerful serve is on point at Wimbledon after pledging to donate 100 euros for every ace he hits to the Ukrainian Relief Fund. Mr. Hilcox, whose par is suited to grass courts, is third on the list of number of aces hit on the ATP Tour this year with 452 behind big serving Americans John Eisner and Riley Opalka. 70 of Hilcox's ace have come from just six matches on grass, with a 25-year-old winning last week's tune-up event at Hall, where he beat world number one Daniel Medvedev in the final. The grass court Grand Slam banned players from Russia and Belarus from playing at the championships, which begins today following Moscow's invasion of uh, that country. And Russians competing under the International Judo Federation flag topped the medals table on the final day of competition at the Ulaanbaatar Grand Slam in Mongolia. Double European champion Mikhail Igolnikov triumphed in the men's under 90 kilograms final against Uzbekistan Davlad Bobanov with a devastating apron after 1 minute 44 seconds at the strip Irania to secure his fourth Grand Slam. Five time Grand Slam winner Inal Tasov defeated the Netherlands Roy Mayer in the 100, uh, over 100 kg uh, for men in the blink of an eye. That's just 11 seconds. While Matvey Kanikovsky then secured the final gold medal of the day in the men's under 100 kg class with victory against Portugal's. Jorge Fonseca. The Grand Slam ended with athletes competing under the IGF flag, topping the standings with five gold, two silver, and two bronze uh, medals. And Russian Tron Nikita Kucherov, Andrei Vasilevsky, and Mikhail Segachev couldn't help Tampa Bay Lightning achieve a three-peat as Stanley Cup champions despite efforts from goaltender Vasilevsky. They lost in Game 6 to the Colorado Avalanche, who had only one Russian, Valery Nishuskin, and their team. Aturi Lekanen scored the go-ahead goal in the second period to help the Colorado Avalanche win their third Stanley Cup title in franchise history, courtesy of a 2-1 victory in the National Hockey League. Vasilevsky turned aside 20 shots for the Lightning, who were trying to become the seventh team to force a Game 7 after trailing 3-1 in a best-of-seven Cup final. For Nishuskin, he won't be allowed to take the trophy home following a ban by the NHL in response to Russia's invasion of uh, Ukraine. And just before we go, English musician and songwriter Paul McCartney showed his solidarity with Ukraine by waving the country's flag during the encore of his epic Glastonbury set, the world's largest Greenfield Festival. 
the Beatles legend and a huge chair as he stood under the flags, blue and yellow stripes. But for Ukrainian musicians at the festival, it was more than just a gesture. Marko Galinevich of the folk quartet Dakarabrava says for soldiers, for people in Ukraine and around the world, when big stars support you and understand you, it shows you have truth on your side. It gives us inspiration to stand. Ukrainian Eurovision winners Kalush Orchestra also praised the star for his support. The band's frontman, Oleks Kisiuk, said a lot of people follow and listen to their idols, so superstars like him. Expressing their support for Ukraine really helps us to promote our cause. Both bands performed at the festival over the weekend, helping spread their message of resistance and hopefully winning new fans along the way. Thanks for staying with us. That's how we wrap up this morning's show. I'm Ladi Akari Dulwale. Do watch out there. Are updates of these and other stories at 5 o'clock in the world today. But for now, do go out there and have yourselves a wonderful Monday and working week ahead. Good morning.